sera quando la luna si svecchia e ti affrontano le e le coppiette se ne vanno via quanto sei bella Roma quando piove Se già ancora si sente con lì e le finestre so tanti occhi che ti sembrano di quanto sei bella. Na 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 na, quanto sei bella. Rome. In the centre of Italy, in the Lityan province, lies Rome, the capital. Nearly three million people inhabit the ancient city with its seven hills. Our visit begins in the Colosseum, in the ancient centre of the city, by the Tiber. It is said that all roads lead to Rome. What is true is that all roads in Rome lead to the Colosseum. This ancient monument is impressive in terms of size. Admired for the construction skills of the ancient Romans, it however arouses horror when one thinks of the morals of that period. Wasn't it in the Colosseum that Christians were fed to the lions? And wasn't it also there that bloodthirsty Nero had people hunted to death? Fact or fiction? Fact is that many Christians were martyred here. However, by the time construction began, Emperor Nero had already been murdered. The only connection was that he had a giant statue of himself built nearby. It was called Colosso, and in the Middle Ages gave its name to the Colosseum. The oval-shaped building is 186 meters long and 156 meters wide. It had a 57 meter high roof. Back in the year 80 AD, 50,000 people attended theatre performances, sports events and gruesome gladiator fights there. The amphitheatre is an architectural model for sports arenas throughout the world. Next to the Colosseum stands Rome's biggest ancient triumphal arch, the Arch of Constantine. It was erected for the Emperor, Constantine, who in 312 defeated Maxentius. The arch was decorated with reliefs from older buildings so that it would be ready in 315 AD for the 10th anniversary of his rule. The place where Roman youth nowadays plays football is where allegedly the rape of Sabinis took place. We see the Circus Maximus opposite the Aventine, one of the seven hills of Rome. The proportions of the ground show what it was intended for. This is where the chariot races, viewed by 300,000 spectators, took place. And this is how it looked in those days. The model of ancient Rome is in the city museum. At that time, a million people lived there, and Rome was the center of world affairs. What looks like an expanse of ruins from a bird's eye view was the marketplace and centre for the inhabitants of the surrounding hills. The Roman Forum, the ancient Forum of Rome at the foot of Capitoline Hill. The marketplace developed into the monumental centre of the city. Columns, ruins of temples and triumphal arches are witness to Rome having once been a world power. In the 4th century, the Roman Forum lost its importance as the seat of the empire was moved to Constantinople. In the Middle Ages, it was used as a source of building materials and pasture. 
The Marmatinian dungeons are to be found in the neighboring church, where, according to legend, St. Peter was held prisoner. A stairway leads to the Capitoline Hill, directly to the Capitoline She-Wolf. She is supposed to have suckled Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. The bronze equine statue of Marcus Aurelius was retained by mistake, as in the Middle Ages it was taken to be a statue of the first Christian emperor. Nowadays it is the showpiece of the Capitoline Square. A unique ensemble is the House of Senators in the middle with the Palazzo Nuovo and the Palazzo di Conservatori, designed by Michelangelo. They now hold the Capitoline's museum collection. In the inner courtyard of the Palazzo dei Conservatori, there are the remains of the statue of Constantine, estimated to be 12 meters high. The sculpture of the dying Gaul is one of the main attractions in the museum. Other masterpieces are the Venus of the Capitoline, the Venus of Esquiline, this female bust, and the thorn extractor, a Roman bronze sculpture copied from the early Hellenic original. The realistic head of Brutus and the original of Luper the she-wolf are also worth seeing. In the 16th century, Michelangelo designed the Capitoline Square as well as the main steps which lead down to the Piazza Aracelli. Another set of steps leads up to the eponymous church. In the Middle Ages, it was the city's political center because the council met there. A few meters away is one of the most traffic congested squares in Rome, Piazza Venezia. This is the site of the monument to Vittorio Emanuele II and the unification of the Kingdom of Italy. The construction is as awe-inspiring as the name. The overwhelming size of the limestone building does not fit in with the ambience of ancient Rome. It is known irreverently as the typewriter. The monument does a good job as a landmark. The typewriter and Piazza Venezia set the scene to perfection for the miming movements of the police who, with inimitable grace, unravel the Roman traffic chaos. From the Piazza Venezia, one can see the 40-meter-high Trian Column. On its plinth, you can see the Emperor's Golden Urn. It is accessible and decorated with reliefs of his deeds. The Roman Senate made an exception in permitting the building of a grave. Normally, emperors were not laid to rest in the heart of the city. Emperor Trian was, however, regarded as the founder of the new Golden Age. His bronze statue stands in front of the Trian Markets, ancient shopping malls. They were named Augustus Forums, after Caesar Augustus. The forums, or marketplaces, were not only of significance to the families of the gentries, but also to the social and political lives of the citizens. They played an important role in the layout of the city. So the Caesar Forum was a link to the Forum Romanum. The center of ancient Rome was only a stepping stone away from the old city, which stretched as far as the park of Villa Borghese to the north. Via del Corso runs on a diagonal line through the old city. It is the most important north-south access of Rome. Only taxis, buses and residents can travel through the old city. 
Nevertheless, there is a chaos every day. Vespers and cars pollute the air. They push their way between pedestrians who don't give an inch. SPQR is on the gullies. Zanatus populus qui Romanum. Zanat and people of Rome. And the people strut confidently as ever, not just along Via del Corso. A city like Rome with so many monuments is worthy of pride. Nearly every square is a scene from a movie. The Trevi Fountain was immortalized in Fellini's film La Dolce Vita. In the meantime, bathing like Anita Ekberg in the fountain has been forbidden. The superstitious should throw a coin into it. It is meant to ensure that they will return to Rome. Just around the corner is the Marcus Aurelius column, center of Piazza Colonna. Here the reliefs glorify the Caesar's deeds of war. The square on Via del Corso is lined with palaces. Here is Palazzo Chigi, the present seat of the Prime Minister. The Marcus Aurelius column is 30 meters high and consists of 28 blocks of marble. Mime and street artists, singers and actors like to perform against the backdrop of Rome especially on the most important tourist spots. Here, for example, on Piazza della Rotonda in front of the Pantheon. The Pantheon is the best preserved ancient building in Rome. The reason for this is that the dome, originally dedicated to all the gods, very soon became a Christian church. On Piazza della Rotonda, with its cafes and restaurants, there's never a quiet moment. It's a tourist area, good for businessmen as they can afford to charge high prices. For your money, you get great views of the fountain and the obelisk. Another obelisk, made out of a shrine to Isis, adorns the elephant sculpture designed by Gian Lorenzo Benini on the Piazza Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, right by the Pantheon. Accompanied by this canzona, we arrive at the most beautiful square in Rome, Piazza Navona, with the famous four-stream fountain. The obelisk which decorates it is a symbol of papal power. Pope Innocent X commissioned it, and Bernini created another masterpiece. Near to the four-stream fountain, two more fountains decorate Piazza Navona. From its outline, one can recognize that it used to be a stadium. From a helicopter, one can clearly see the full length of the sports venue. Piazza del Popolo is best observed from the air. Via del Corso is one of three streets which form an arrow opening onto the square itself. We'll visit the square later. Now we will look at the typical streets and alleyways of the old city between Piazza del Popolo and Piazza Venezia, to the right and left of Corso.
Around this area, Rome doesn't operate like a hectic metropolis. Strolling down here past the antique dealers' little shops and restaurants, one feels as if one has been transported to the provinces. It is exactly as if one were somewhere in a village in Tuscany. The streets have eye-catching names like Via del Mercato, Market Street. Or, for example, Via della Carrozze, Street of Coaches. Antique lovers will be drawn by the aroma of paints and corrosive fluid used by restorers of old furniture who work here in the Via di Coronari. The Romans' hunger for beauty goes hand in hand with their hunger for food in their stomachs at one o'clock on the dot. Time to go to eat. The Romans don't like culinary experiments. One eats Roman, Italian and leaves the foreign cuisine to others. At Mario's in Via della Vite, there are innumerable photographs of famous people who share a passion for Italian cuisine. Mario's home-cooked white beans have already won over Terence Hill and Marcello Mastroianni or tennis stars like Martina Navratilova. Her tennis colleague, Jim Corrier, goes there too because here one concentrates on food, not on the famous faces visiting the old city. The prices in Roman restaurants are refreshingly low. Commercially speaking, income from these restaurants is quite low, but it is more than compensated for by the luxury shops on Via de Condotti. This is where the famous Italian fashion designers and jewelry dealers live. Those wanting to treat their loved one to a special breakfast will find everything here. Rolls with gold and diamonds. Via de Condotti, the epitome of Roman excess. At the end of Via de Condotti, one finds oneself between art and commerce. After the rush of checks and credit cards, one is suddenly standing in a square which is recognizable from countless postcards. Piazza de España with the Spanish Steps. Pietro and Gian Lorenzo Bernini's fountains in the form of a barge are in the front of them. And what's an original Bernini compared to the Spanish steps, which are not original and really ought to be called the French steps? In the 18th century, the French had them built to connect the church, Trinita dei Monti, which is positioned higher up with the Spanish square. Nevertheless, the locals and the tourists called them the Spanish steps. It is the meeting place of youth and, unfortunately, after football matches, can be the place where the football hooligans meet up. It is not far to Piazza del Popolo from the church. Porta del Popolo has been the city's northern gate since ancient times. From then on, the appearance of the oval square has been vastly altered. Once there were two pyramids, and Nero's grave is said to have been here. These ancient constructions were replaced with churches. A church was built over the grave of Nero to banish his evil spirit. 
One of the oldest obelisks of Rome has fountains decorated with lions and dates from the 13th century BC. It was built in the reign of Ramesses II and brought to Rome by Augustus. The twin churches of Santa Maria di Miracoli and Santa Maria in Monte Santo, which replaced the pyramids, were intended to demonstrate to the pillagers the power of Rome as they entered the holy city. From here, Via del Babuino, Via del Corso and Via di Ripetta lead to the center. One can also go up to Pincio, a hill from where one can enjoy one of the most beautiful sunsets over Rome. The next day starts at the point where one saw the sun set. Leaving Pincio, one sets off for the biggest park in Rome, Park Villa Borghese. Around and hidden in the park are villas with grand names such as Villa Medici with its numerous ancient statues. or Galleria Nazionale di Arte Moderna, in which sculptures and paintings from the 19th and 20th centuries are exhibited. Villa Giulia is the home of the National Etruscan Museum. And Casino and Galleria Borghese are named after Scipione Caffarelli Borghese, who had the building conceived for his art collection. Canova created the classical statue of Paulina Borghese Bonaparte. Raphael's The Burial of Christ is one of the most important works. For the education of Amour and later with the Swan, Tizian was inspired by the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. The museum is one of the most significant private collections in the world. lake which invites animals and people to paddle was once the gates of Rome, leading to its hills planted with vines. They belonged to the Borghese family who gave their name to the park. Horse lovers will be attracted to the park. In Piazza di Siena, especially early in the year, there are riding tournaments. There is also a race course, and Rome's zoo is in the park. At weekends, families meet here to picnic. Those who want to, take this route which leads directly to a world of art. Villa Giulia, completed in 1553, now houses the Museo Nazionale Etrusco, the most significant Etruscan collection in the world. The showpiece is the sarcophagus of the husband and wife, dating from 530 BC. The origins of the Etruscans are unknown, although they influenced Roman culture even more than the Greeks, whose influence came later. The villa tells us much about the beginnings of Roman culture. Let's move on. From the north of Rome, we will move east, going to the southern gates of the city and the vicinity of ancient Rome, to the south of the Roman Forum. One of the access points to Villa Borghese is Porta Pinciana. The gate is at the entrance to Via Vittorio Veneto. Via Veneto. For many, this name is synonymous with chic, stylishness, elegance, flair and the Dolce Vita. 
This is where some of the most exclusive shops, hotels, bars and cafes, as well as luxury houses which have been admired since the start of the 1900s. The architecture still looks splendid even though the Dolce Vita is over. The time is gone when stars from Fellini circles met up here. Nowadays, they try to conserve their glamour of the past for the tourists with exhibitions of photographs. Chaplin and Garbo were known to have come here. The high prices and the memories remain to this day. Today, advertising strategists try to be impressive by showing photographic evidence that the great Fellini made ads for theatre in those days. From Porta Pinciana, Via Veneto leads to Piazzo Barbarini. Mafio Barbarini, a member of the powerful Familia Barbarini, who later became Pope Urban VIII, commissioned Bernini to do the Triton Fountain, a masterpiece like his Four Stream Fountain. Rome could rightfully be called the city of obelisks and fountains. The street running from Piazza Barbarini to Santa Maria Maggiore is indeed adorned with four fountains. Logically, it is called Via della Quattro Fontana. Two figures represent the river gods of Tiber and Arno. The other two, Juno and Diana, faith and courage. The four fountains are related to the Baroque church San Carlo in that street. The story of Romulus and Ramus and the she-wolf is ever present here. The street leads down to the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, whose bell tower can be seen from afar. The church is one of the four patriarchal basilicas in Rome. According to legend, Pope Liberia founded a church on the spot where the Mother of God made snowfall in August. Ever since, the 5th of August is celebrated as the Feast of Mary of the Snow. But in reality, Pope Sixtus III had it built in honor of the Blessed Virgin. After the Council of Ephesus, she was revered as the Mother of God. The church keeps the original style of an early Christian basilica and has a mosaic of the crowning of Mary in the apsa. A Madonna also decorates the column in the square in front of the church. Is the snow miracle just a legend? Refreshment is always in demand in Rome. And this is what is provided by the many fountains like this one here in Piazza della Repubblica. The square, named after Stazioni Termini, has just been renovated. The area around the station, which in the 19th century was a desirable residential area, attracts, as in many large cities, drug addicts and criminals. They also congregate around the Piazza della Repubblica, which also covers the area of the former Diocletian thermal baths. The church of Santa Maria degli Angeli was built from the remains of the baths. A house of worship whose appearance alone radiates enormous power is the Lateran Basilica. In the Middle Ages, this was the center of Rome, the papal residence where judgments were passed. The statue of the she-wolf and the equine statue of Marcus Aurelius are testament to the importance of the square. Rome has four patriarchal basilicas. San Giovanni in Laterano is the most important building. It is the highest ranking church for pilgrims coming to the Eternal City. 
San Giovanni was the center of power in the Catholic Church until 1377. In that year, the Pope moved his seat from Lateran to the Vatican. This, the oldest of Christian churches, was begun in 313 and first consecrated to Christ the Redeemer. Then, in the Middle Ages, it was dedicated to John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. Nowadays, San Giovanni is governed by the papal representative. On Holy Thursdays, the Pope washes the feet of 12 poor people. The Lateran Palace, where the Pope resided until 1308, before going into exile in Avignon, belongs to the Church. Obviously, terrorists see the Basilica as still being a centre of power. Here, opponents of the state made assassination attempts. They were certainly confident of the spectacular impact it would have. Rome and its churches. Here, in front of San Clement, one waits for the doors of one of the most interesting churches to open. The Basilica di San Clement is the only church in Rome whose roots go back to pre-Christian times. Its three building sections make it architecturally interesting. This is the new basilica, the upper floor with magnificent mosaics and a small inner court. The Caterina Chapel in the upper church is worth looking at. In 1430, Masolino created these masterpiece frescoes. They depict the martyrdom of the Holy Caterina, who died by the sword. This Romanesque lower chapel was first opened in 1861. A dwelling has been evacuated in the lower levels, in which the Romans paid homage to the sun god, Mithras. The cult spread throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, and for a while it looked as if it would replace Christianity. The history of Rome is not only a story about power, but also of powerlessness. For example, out of fear of the opposition, Caesar Aurelius had the 18-kilometer-long Aurelian Wall built in the 3rd century. It symbolized the fall of the power of Rome and was not a success. Inside these walls from the sky, one can see the structure of the Caracalla Thermal Baths, the second largest baths in Rome. The thermal baths were important because sanitary facilities were rare. Near to the baths, one can make out the round church, Santo Stefano Rotondo. It is not possible to see it from ground level because of the many trees. This is how the brick building once looked. Archaeologists are attempting the reconstruction of the oldest city center buildings in the whole of Italy. The view inside is well worth it. Ionic columns divide the room into a gallery and the altarpiece. The church was built on the site of a former Mitras holy tower to replace paganism with Christianity. Roman mothers used to bring their children to the church for the Feast of Stephanus to protect them from bad influences. They showed them what could happen to naughty children by showing pictures of those martyred for the faith. Santo Stefano Rotondo is especially linked to German, as the church belonged to a college for theology students from Germany. Another interesting round building is the Vesta Temple. Not to be confused with the Vesta Temple in the Roman Forum. It's from the 2nd century BC and is the oldest marble temple in Rome. Very few people know this and just see the temple because they want to go to the church of Santa Maria in Cosmodin. Even that is of little interest to most. What they want to see is the Bocca della Verita, the mouth of truth. In the past, it scared liars. If one put one's hand in its mouth and it snapped, one was trapped. This is even meant to have happened. And there was a hidden room behind it.
After the game of truth, it's on to Ponte Palatino. From here, you can see the ruined bridge, the Ponte Rotto. It was begun in 179 BC as a wooden bridge and completed 30 years later as the first stone bridge in Rome. The ruins of the bridge are in front of the Tiber Island. According to legend, a barge laden with gold sank here. In fact, the island made the building of the bridge Ponte Fabrizio easier and was worth more than gold. In the south of Rome, the Porta Sebastiano makes an opening in the Aurelian Wall and opens up, as expected, at the gates of Rome. Here there is a type of business that is visible all over Rome. When the traffic lights are red, everything conceivable is sold. The flower seller's territory is on the Via Appia Antica at the city gates. Elsewhere, car windscreens are cleaned and cigarettes sold. Or things will be offered for sale that one only rarely needs. Occasionally, what's on offer can help one out of a predicament. If one goes down the Via Appia, one comes across the church of San Sebastiano. It was built over one of the numerous catacombs. According to law, the dead must be buried outside the city. That is how underground community graves came into being, most of them decorated with frescoes. The bones of Peter and Paul were supposed to have laid here for a time. For Peter, the Appian Way was where an important meeting took place. He was escaping martyrdom in Rome. He met a man. He asked, Domini Quo Vardis? Sir, where are you going? He answered, I am going to be crucified for the second time. Peter recognized Christ and turned back regretfully to his destiny. In the film Quo Vardis, this legendary meeting is immortalized. In the past, the Appian Way was an important highway. The plaster road surface is still in place in some parts. The road leads from the Roman Forum to Brindisi in southeast Italy. It served both trade and military purposes. Once it was the rich Romans who built mausoleums here. The rich still live here today, hidden behind walls. The poor lived in Trastevere, on the other side of the Tiber. In contrast, the Catholic clergy did not live far away in their own state, the Vatican. Trastevere, that was the area for the poor. They subsisted Trans-Tiberum, on the other side of the Tiber. Hence the name of the district and of the church, Santa Maria in Trastevere. In recent times, speculators have recognized the charm of the old buildings and the weaving alleyways. Rents have gone up astronomically. Carlo Fontana, who made this fountain, would never have expected this. The visitor looking for authentic Rome will be enchanted. In the center, Santa Maria in Trastevere, the first church in Rome that was dedicated to Mary. To this day, Romans are proud of this fact. The basilica with three aisles should be visited early in the day. Then one can enjoy the magic of this district.
Leaving Trastevere in the direction of the banks of the Tiber, one can take a rest to reflect to Piazza Trilusa, the edge of this district. There is a monument here to a poet who wrote in Roman dialect. Trilusa besought his fellow men not to allow Trastevere to stoop to becoming a tourist attraction, but to keep its authenticity. But it is nearly too late for that. One can go over the Ponte Sisto to return to the inner city. However, it is not recommended to take the streets by the Tiber. To escape the non-stop traffic, it is best to go towards Palazzo Farnese. Around the corner are sites like those we know already from the other districts. Fountains, romantic streets and squares. The tricolor, the French flag, hangs over one of these squares. It marks Palazzo Farnese, nowadays seat of the French embassy. A pity, say those interested in culture, because the palace with its art treasures can only be visited on exceptional occasions. There is still the square with its great cafes. From here one can admire the patrician palaces built by Antonio da Zangalo and Michelangelo for Cardinal Farnese. From here it's just a few steps to Campo di Fiori, the field of flowers. For Giordano Bruno, monk and philosopher, the square was just a place for burning people at the stake and where he was burnt as a heretic. Nowadays there is no longer violence on the former place of execution. Fruits, vegetables and of course flowers are sold here. The mounted police are a tourist attraction. People chat at the markets, refresh themselves at the drinking fountains which supply drinking water everywhere in Rome. Since Roman times, the water has been coming from the Apennine Mountains and even today the water is of an extraordinarily good quality. One can't say that about the Tiber. In any event, Rome's river is praised in many songs. The Tiber. As late as 1870, when high walls were built to enclose it, fear of flooding lessened and people's lives were no longer in danger. And with its many bridges, songs often pay homage to it. Ponte Vittorio Emanuele is one of the most impressive bridges. It leads to the Vatican and to Castel Sant'Angelo. Castel Sant'Angelo is as big a tourist attraction as the Colosseum. Originally the building served as a mausoleum for the Emperor Hadrian and his followers, and then in the 3rd century it was turned into a fortress. 
Hadrian had a cylindrical building erected on the square foundation. It was crowned with a quadriga, which was later replaced with an angel's figure. Popes from the nearby Vatican sought refuge in the fortress. The Vatican. The leavers, tourists and pilgrims from all over the world come especially to Rome to see it once close up. We change location to this gate in the south of Rome. Looking through the keyhole, St. Peter's can be seen from a different perspective, about five kilometers away. Even from this distance, its imposing size is evident. Let's go there. St. Peter and the Vatican have already been praised by many poets. It is praised for being the most unique place in the world, the most impressive and famous church in Christianity, such a mighty work of art so that one is lost for words. It is impossible here to describe the Vatican in all its artistic glory. The square with its colonnades designed by Bernini is impressive. 284 columns and 88 supports from Travertine. The columns are arranged in four rows and form an oval shape. If one goes to the focal point of the ellipse and looks around, one sees only the first row of the colonnades. That is how masterfully Bernini played with the perspective. Over the columns, on a wide balustrade, 140 holy figures are witnesses made of stone to the triumph of the church. Two fountains made from a single piece of granite fuse harmoniously with Bernini's work. The middle of the square is marked with a 25 meter high obelisk. It took four months for the 300 ton monolith to be erected here. Daily, clergy and tourists make up the regular audience. Most priests work in the Vatican, the center of Catholic power. The Vatican State is the smallest state in the world. At Easter, when the Pope prays Urbi et Orbi, the square is full. Or when he reads the Mass from the window of his study, Sento il bisogno di esprimere il vivo dolore in me suscitato dalla notizia dell'uccisione di Don Giuseppe Diana, parroco della diocesi di Aversa, colpito da spietati assassini mentre si apprestava a celebrare la Santa Messa. Religion and commerce are not at odds with each other in this case. Those who have seen him would like to have him at home, too. There are enough souvenir dealers for any size of crowd. The Vatican is a sovereign state with its own anthem and guards. For centuries, the Swiss Guard has kept watch. They work for the security of the Pope, wearing traditional uniform and check everyone who wants admittance to the Vatican Palace. St. Peter's and the Apostolic Palace are part of the same architectural entity. 1,400 rooms with an area of 30,000 square meters are hidden behind the walls, and 20 inner courtyards covering almost the same area. Unlike the Vatican Palace, there is access to the roof of St. Peter's, accessible by lift or 142 steps. 
Michelangelo's dome, measuring 42 meters diagonally, is higher. In Nero's reign, Peter was crucified on the Vatican Hill and buried nearby. Constantine built the first church to St. Peter as a memorial to him. The physical direction of the current basilica is based on the position of the old church. Peter's grave is in the center of the church, overlooked by the papal altar, the 29-meter high bronze canopy built by Bernini, a masterpiece of high baroque. You are Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and to you I shall give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This was Christ's will. All the popes who sit on St. Peter's throne maintain that this is why they are God's representatives on earth. Accounts of the history of the church and of the popes can be found in the Vatican Library. The art treasures of the Vatican Museum are beyond measure. Famous worldwide is the Lacoon group from the first century AD. The museum houses ancient sculptures, religious art and priceless works by amongst others Tizian, Michelangelo or Raphael. Raphael designed the stanzas, the papal dreams, which Julius II commissioned. The Sistine Chapel. It is regarded as the highlight of the Renaissance art and the crowning point of Michelangelo's career. The restoration of the frescoes that began in the 1980s is complete. Not only did fresh and strong colors reappear, but the overpainting done for modesty's sake was removed. The well-known artist, Daniela Dal Volterra, known thereafter as the Trousers Painter, had to overpaint on the orders of Pope Pius IV because the naked figures by Michelangelo were thought obscene. The choice of colours for the unique frescoes on the ceiling is brilliant. The theme is the creation and early man. The most famous fresco in the Sistine Chapel is the creation of Adam. God the Father touches Adam with his finger and gives him life. Here again one can see the power of the restored color in the frescoes. The act of creation in Rome will never be absolutely finished. This is another reason why this metropolis can be called the Eternal City.